Good morning. I'm so honored and happy to be here and to finally see in person these monks that we've heard are so famous as being wonderful students. So this is year two now. It's called Introduction to Evolution. My name is Marge Sedensky, Margaret. I'm from a place called the University of Washington in Seattle. In my country, North America, Seattle's on the tip. It's way up here. It's halfway around the world from where we are now. Um, but I grew up and feel at home in another part of my country called Cleveland. The University of Washington is beautiful. Beautiful mountains, water, trees, very pretty. ตอนนั้นเงี้ยมิงล่ะนี่มาร์ทเซเรนสกีเรสอันนี้งานทันเดอะวอชิงตันกิจุกล่ะลงเนี่ยขันนี้สดิคอลเลอร์เลยนะอ
Manzo Chile, Tudanda, Tavana Shitong, Tadu, Kandestona, Hundley, Meditama, Rigsig, Hundred Tangsi, Chigu, Lejora, Shuking Haritigu, Redito, Lanes Chi. And what do you know about evolution? So just small two, three monks talk, and then we'll come back in a couple minutes. And Pelgu Ribo for La Karishin, US and Dis, Dila Dita Pusho, Nisum Yamdu, Rukaji Suni, any Kerosina, Penzu, Tudurna Roches, Tua Dinsur, Dito. What does anybody or group remember about DNA? Volunteer? It's a molecule in a cell which is passed on from one generation to the next. Perfect, perfect. And what does that have to do with genes? Anybody? DNA holds the gene. Perfect, perfect. And what does a gene have to do with how I look compared to how you look? There's somebody wants to say. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, okay. so the gene from the father is passed on to the to his son. Yes, mothers and daughters too. <laughs> very good, very good. And then uh, evolution? Evolution. So we look different uh, because the structure of DNA are different. That's why. And evolution is the notion that even though I look like my mother, I look less like my grandmother and so on, that subtle changes in our genetics over time will lead us to look different. So those physics guys that were here told us what a good class this was, and they, and they weren't kidding. So, so this is that DNA molecule. It's like a giant sentence spelling out what I will be like. The sentence only has four letters of the alphabet. So to make something complicated, it has to be really long. In this example, it's all packed into that thing up there called a chromosome, which is in a cell. 
and the two lady shall rest, chromosom light, and dig her in your law and not upon your rest, cell light in your rest. This particular cell has a special compartment of membrane around the DNA, so it has a nucleus. That makes it a special kind of cell. Dig in the little career or lana, chemo your rest, and tabundi in the lola. Dig any mixed roses to rest the tabundi. Every living thing, the flies buzzing around here, the grass, me, you, are made of cells. And they all have that DNA in them that's the blueprint for what they are. Cells divide, reproduce, and pass on that genes to their offspring. All living things then need to use their cells to make energy, to reproduce themselves, and to keep a level, to keep um, on an even uh, function. Next slide. So way up, to, this is the cell, this is a cell again. Cells themselves are made of molecules, and mo molecules, the very top is trying to show these things called atoms. H hydrogen, oxygen, the next step down is water. The <laughs> And this slide you'll see over and over in your studies trying to show what I think is usually called the staircase of life. So every life has cells. Cells can be different from each other within a body and make a tissue like a bone. Bones can get organized into something that supports our muscles and protects our heart and lungs, and then is covered by all these other kinds of tissues to become an organism. A group of organisms then becomes a population. In this case, this population of animals has to eat, uh, has to interact with other animals, and that's its ecosystem. That ecosystem become quite large and uh, basically all of these ecosystems are all over and make up our beautiful planet, the Earth. When we speak of evolution in, uh, in Western people's minds, immediately we think of Charles Darwin. Evolution, to me, is a fundamental, important part of all biology. It answers big questions. How did I get here? How do I relate to everything around me? How did life even come to this planet? Some of the beauty of Darwin's idea is it so simply answers all those questions, actually. A very smart biology professor said, Evolution is what created life on this world and what will keep it going. If we don't understand evolution, we will never understand our world. 
Dilo do kengu ri pa gi gi ya ku chi khari shir la na pelgur gi gyu ni ta tan da ngo zu se ko la ga li jua zu dang jua ra che so di zu di khan de stu gu yu me tan da ba du khari chu yu me di ngara zu ha ku re es pelgur gi ni ta ngan na shi ma ong ba khari chu yu me di sang ma pelgur gi lang ni ha ku re lang shi re es ko ang gi and and when we start getting deep into it you understand how related we are to all living things dilo do di tan da pelgur ri ba ya ga ya ting sa ru bo chu ra di go chu de pa chu ma ra zu ki me na ru di Darwin's first observation, though, was that um, the environment and living things are in a constant conversation or dynamic. Each affects the other. It's impossible to separate them. An organism living in its environment, a population living in an environment has a lot of variety. And individuals in there pass on their traits to their offspring. <laughs> Those traits that come to the offspring that allow it to flourish in that environment are stay with those offspring and allow them to produce more offspring. Over time then, an organism can become uniquely adapted to the environment. The environment, though, puts pressure on the organism to keep adapting as the environment changes. So, for example, hundreds of years ago, um, a disease swept through Europe that was the, the, a plague. Some people, of that, in some places, half of the people died because this plague was so bad. But some people had a trait that made them immune. They didn't know they had such a thing until they lived through the plague. If that trait was around in maybe 10% of the people before the plague, and everyone else died, after the plague, almost everybody that was still left, that was fit for their environment, lived. Had maybe 100% had the trait. So in a catastrophic sort of change of environment, one trait was very highly selected. Charles Darwin is always shown as this old grouchy looking guy here. Um, who came up with the idea of evolution. But when he started out, he was just, by my point of view, as an old, as an old woman, he was just a young boy. He was 21 years old. 21? 22. So he, he's from a small little country here, England. He's going to get on a boat, say goodbye to his parents, and go off on this treacherous journey for five years. 
He's going to travel down where many people have never seen, and he's observing. He's just observing to what, what he sees around him. Some places far inland, he sees remains of creatures that live in the sea, and they're, they're way up on a mountaintop. Some places deep down along a cliff, he sees the remains of an animal that should have been up on the top, up on the surface. His ship gets caught in an earthquake right here, and he sees the earth lift up and bring all these animals from the ocean up out clinging to life on rocks. So this was his trip over five years. That top where it says Plymouth is where he left from, and once he got home, he never left home again. But it, it took him a long time to think about what he had seen. I like fossils and I like biology, so I went to see this one particular place, which is quite famous, a bunch of very new islands off the coast of South America. These islands have just come out from under the ocean um, through volcanoes. They're very new. And in some ways, very bleak. So you can only get to them if you're a bird or a seed or if you hitch a ride on a boat. So those are some of the Galapagos Islands. When he approached them, next one, he said, what a bleak and horrible place. You can see where the lava has just cooled, just barely cooled. Uh, that's made these islands. See how it was liquid just a little bit ago. And you're trudging along here as a tourist, getting hot and looks like you're on the moon. When you turn a corner, and here's a plant. It's like a perfect gardener had said, here's a little low spot. Some water might get here if it ever rains. It can use energy from the sun to grow. It has these barrels to stall, store water whenever it rains. And it has all these horrible needles to keep birds or lizards from eating it. It's successful in this harsh, harsh environment because it has perfect traits to live there. The person who helped Darwin figure it out was this man who was relatively uneducated named Alfred Russell Wallace. They thought a lot about these birds that, he had, that Darwin had seen on different islands. Very specific kinds of related, very related birds but they were only on individual islands. 
So one of these kinds of birds called a finch is called a cactus finch. Here's its cactus. It has a, you can see it's looking down in the pod looking for insects or seeds. And it's got a beak just perfect for allowing it to be successful to live there. On a whole other island, there's a little bit of sand and beach, and this one has a big fat bill, and it's ripping apart bark, and it's eating seeds. It's successful because it has the tools in this beak to live and make offspring. Another finch on another island lives in a different kind of uh, type of plants around it, and it has a perfect next. Go ahead, we'll finish. Has a perfect beak and tongue to get into its foods. But that little cactus finch might be in trouble. Just since people have been coming and watching, this cactus is becoming more rare. That's because this big scary thing has claws that they can rip it open, skin that doesn't mind the needles, and teeth that can chew up these cactus. So maybe that little bird's children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren over a very long time are going to have to find traits that allow them to eat on something other than this cactus, maybe. Some of the islands get rain and are quite wet. And for thousands of years, these big tortoises lived on those islands. And again, there were specific kinds on specific islands because they'd been separated and had developed their own traits. People come and people bring goats. This slow reptile is no match for a goat that can run around and eat all the grass. So people, in a kind of maybe unnatural selection, have already made some of these species extinct. In fact, when I visited, there was one left of its species, a tortoise. His name was Lonesome George. What was the name? Lonesome George. Lonesome George. They were trying really hard to mate him with related species so that his genes wouldn't be lost. No luck. George died and his species is gone. And there is a very big thing by the whole world to get all the goats off of these islands. 
Cezanta But natural selection is not just something for an exotic place in the Galapagos or the jungle. Darwin, in fact, in the beginning of his book on the origin of species, says you can see it at home. It's easiest sometimes to see it in extreme environments, though, and so we're going to talk about two things from Tibet. We think that people started, humans like us, first came from Africa and spread all over the world. Some of them came up to high altitudes. So there are people at high altitudes here in the Andes, here in Ethiopia, but the highest and biggest plateau in the world where people live is Tibet. There's hardly any oxygen in Tibet. It's 40% less than where I live in Seattle. If I had to climb a flight of stairs in Tibet, I'd be, <laughs> and I'd be about this color blue. But you Tibetans have better blood vessels to get oxygen to your tissue, to your muscle, to your heart, to your brain. In fact, they know, um, people love, scientists love to study this kind of stuff. They know that there's a variation in Tibetans that's very common, like 80% of Tibetans have this, this variation in their DNA um, that allows them to live at altitude. Or that it makes them successful living at altitude. Probably 80% of you here have it. I'm sure I don't have it. Your relatives in, who are around Tibet but are stayed low, they have it maybe 15%. But Tibetans have 80% of Tibetans have this, have this variation. That's what allowed them to be successful and stay living in Tibet. In fact, it's called the super athlete gene. People in South America and the Andes live pretty high, not as high as Tibet, but they don't have this variation. They've only been there for not even half as long as Tibetans have lived in Tibet. So maybe in another 20,000 years we'll see some changes in their genes. Ethiopians in Africa have lived at these altitudes for 70,000 years, twice as long as Tibetans, but they don't have the same changes in their DNA as Tibetans do. And they don't live nearly as high. That Ethiopian, the mountains there are not nothing like in Tibet. It's not like the altitude causes those genes to, to change. It's only those people can have children at that high altitude who have that trait. It's like the plague. Your ancestors didn't even know they had that ability till they went up there and saw that those who had more children and more children had these adaptations. Dilla 
Dünyur çiğ 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 şudan dirikte diyoruz, o diyor ama razı hakuyoruz. This is a butterfly that's native to Tibet. Da di çemal evci da di pöle tohayoruz. There are different species of it all over at mountainous areas of the world. Da di kura satusa riyo se saja jura, di ne sakui la ta oyna, di ne çemal evci di rik minda aman buç tohayoruz. This butterfly has really dark wings um, that allow it to soak up the, the heat to stay alive. They also have the ability to keep their wings really flat so the wind doesn't blow them around and they can uh, navigate at that high altitude. The ones that are in other parts of the world will have some similar traits, but this one is exactly only in Tibet. So, summary, you can't understand your world. You can't understand why things are the way they are here, right here in our own backyard, maybe, without knowing something about evolution. Organisms, living things, respond to their environment, change with it, and also change the environment. Natural selection has led to organisms adapting to their environment. Occasionally it's a catastrophe like the plague, but ordinarily it's very slow, millions of years. If I were to count a, to a billion starting now, every second go one, two, three, day and night, no sleep, no eating, I'd get to a billion when I'm a hundred years old. And by then you'd have to carry on this lecture. So I would hope that we would get to know you a little bit. I know we don't speak the same language, but I was wondering if maybe five, you five could say your names and tell me if you could be any animal, what would you like to be? I would like to be an eagle so I could fly. I'd like to be light and graceful and fly around. I would like to be light and graceful and fly around. So, sir, what's your name? Kiran Singh Kharis. Shut up. Can't up. Okay. If you could be any animal, what? Simjin Chi Kari Chindu Du Simjin Zimba in a D in a Dixares. Ta. 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 Tiger? A tiger? Yes. Why? Kari Chinis. Tsikudu. It's really nice to look at. <laughs> at you? And you get like a get like a thing, Karis. And it's MJ Kari in the Dixar is. What's the name? Something. His name is something. something. Yeah. And Simji. La. Since he is a tiger, I'll I I'll, I'll be a lion. Oh, okay. <laughs> there must be some peaceful animals here. Stop good Simji. <laughs> What's your name, sir? Ming Kari. Tenzin Yuan Ten. Okay, and your animal to you. 
Pumpkin. Peacock. Peacock. Yeah. Oh, nice. <laughs> your name? Nama. And your animal? Simji yeah. Hari. Yeah. 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 Strong. Yeah. 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 Chimbu chi. Any shuk chimbu yoro say yeah. Your name? Say it again. Lungto. Lungto. An animal. Simji Hari. Chindu dus. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Same. Same yak. Yeah, yeah. Tiger, lion, two two yaks, <laughs> and what would you? Peacock, right? So you can see your personality. The kids are the. They like to watch it and they like sing it. Yeah, you too. I'm not sure. I'm sorry. I'm sure I won't remember your names, but I'll remember your animals now. So don't tell us. Now, kids are being the thing. Mary, see, the kids are singing. Carry on with the thing. Sorry. Your name. Dorji. 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 Sorry. Animal. Simji. Hari. Chidi. 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 Okay. A dove. A dog. Dove. Dove. A dove. Dove. Yeah. D O V. Yeah. Ah, peaceful. This is a peaceful guy. She did change the shell. Let's get on. Sir, can I change the? Paddy. 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 Okay. An animal. Simji. A cuckoo. A cuckoo. Does that mean the same in English? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Because of its beautiful sound. Oh. Voice. Oh yes. Do you sing? She thank you. Yes. No. <laughs> okay. La. Rinchen. His name is Rinchen. Rinchen. Simjin Hari. La. Chiu. A bird. A bird. See his name. Chiparishas. Jamya. Jamya. Yeah. Bird. Simjin. La. Chimala. Chimala. A butterfly. A butterfly. Tenzin. Tenzin. Okay. Simjin. Shawa. Chimale, a butterfly. Yeah, the Himalayan butterfly. Rinal dingi dilwalas. Chimale, yes. Only Tibetans could it be a Tibetan butterfly. Rinal. Pebaji pebaji ni ita kare. Chimale, thanda rito yus satu sa chimale bichi tu dilwalas. So, do you have any questions for us? Megan is going to speak too, but do you have any questions about this morning? I think it's important to to. to hmm. To understand that we have these traits, and they just randomly go to our offspring, but the ones that help them are the ones that are preserved and go from generation to generation, very slowly. Chua yo ena tangro chesra, ani thanda Megan kora yanzinda thi res, ani thanda ngazu keshi porshi deras, keshi dinu ngarazu nanglo yo res. Sine ta kuriu nala, kuriu lata ni ani thanda keshi kari nia bugu yu me di ta ni ani kari pinto wa ni di nia, ani ma ma regul ma te ru resti. Questions? Two of you is. Megan will be happy to answer them. Two of you and Megan will link it is. And the Kiwi Bola, Dota, Susan, Tomada, Jugila, that did to change in Bosuga. That to change in Bosan, that to change the change, Junza, you begin very much. So we say that life started from atoms. So is there a cause? Uh, is there a cause we can say that, okay, this caused atoms to form? So is well, there that's, any cause? that's a wonderful question, and it, those are hard questions. Obviously, we don't have, um, no scientists were there, but when the earth first formed, we, it was very different than now. There are forces between atoms that attract them to each other and cause them to become molecules. A very important one is water. When the earth was first formed, it was just hot and it was being bombarded by other things from outer space, so water could not stay on the earth. Water 
Once the earth got a little older and colder, water could stay. And then all these chemicals like carbon, hydrogen, oxygen had a chance to be in the water and to interact and form molecules. That in turn thought to lead to some very simple, very simple forms of life. Now this is four billion years ago almost. Those molecules that were arranged in a certain way were able to actually make copies of themselves and that became the traits of a first cell. And we all started there. We all started. DNA is in er the most simple cell you can think of. The genetic material is DNA, just like it's in us. We all have that ancestor that somehow formed the first living thing. But how those molecules became a cell, is, it's clear that that's what happened, but people fight over the details of that. Any thoughts? There's a famous experiment, the Miller-Urey experiment, done by a professor and his student. And they wanted to know how life could have first originated. I think that is what you are getting at. So they took a glass beaker and they filled it with um, just water and things that they thought might have been there on the earth before life had begun. They tried to mimic the environment of what scientists believe the earth looked like before life. It was acidic, it was hot, and there was energy from lightning coming in. They did this experiment many, many times with different conditions because they weren't quite sure what Earth's environment was really like back then. Most days they came back after several weeks and the beaker was still just plain water. But eventually they got the conditions right and miraculously when they came back after two weeks of letting the beaker sit with energy and the right environment, they came back and there were the beginning building blocks of life. Nothing alive, but there were molecules that looked like the beginning of DNA and molecules that looked like the beginning of proteins, the amino acids. So from that experiment, scientists think that the building blocks could have started um, on Earth and that eventually, given a lot of time, their concentration would have built up and they perhaps could have started coming together in more complicated ways. And there are other scientists doing other very interesting and exciting experiments trying to see how those molecules as you build them up could start to become more life-like. So they've been able to make short stretches of 
RNA, which is very similar to DNA and it is in all of our cells. And that short string of RNA with the right sequence of letters, those A, C's, T's, well, U's and G's, was able to make a copy of itself. And other scientists have also been able to make what looks like the beginning of cell membranes, something that would form a sphere and that the RNA could be inside. So scientists are continuing this work and building it up to see if we can better understand how you can build from the basic building blocks to a cell. And while this is all very interesting and we think this may have been how life formed on Earth, there is another theory. Many scientists think that life on Earth did not really begin on Earth, that we were hit with an asteroid, a, a rock from space, that brought life from another planet to us. And we don't know which one is right yet. <laughs> but when we look at rocks that come to us from space, we again see the building blocks of life. We have not found life and cells on those rocks yet, but it's clear that out in space are also the building blocks for life. We think, are there other questions? Until she by you is. So uh, we can see diverse forms of life on Earth now. So when the first life form, does it have the ability to form diverse forms of life as we, have, we can see this now? Uh, good question. Uh, yes, um, we believe that all life that we have on Earth, from humans to bacteria to birds that fly, all came from one original ancestor. We'll be talking more after the tea break about this and about how you go from one species to all the variety of life on Earth. But scientists have a name for this ancestor. We call it LUCA, L-U-C-A, for Last Universal Common Ancestor. We think that ancestor, it was a, a simple single cell. And it is the process of evolution that that single cell was able to slowly change over a long period of time and diversify into all the different life we have today. Another question. 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 
Are these the same <coughs> that you have found in the experiment? You said you have, uh, they have found building blocks, right? Are these two same or? Yes, they are the same, but we see more variety on the asteroids than we got in the beaker. One reason we think life on Earth all came from the single ancestor is because we all use the same building blocks, just 20 amino acids. But in the beaker and on the asteroids are hundreds of different amino acids. Why life only uses 20, we don't know, but we believe it's because that's what our original ancestor had. Another question. So in Buddhism, the Thoma Yomari led Ra. There is, uh, it, we consider anything beginningless and endless. So when you said we have single ancestor, so this is in contradiction with each other. So is there any evidence or uh, evidence or reason to say that our ancestor is uh, one? So. Uh, this is a very good question, and I'm going to have to veer into the realm of physics to answer it, I think. We think that life on Earth began with the one ancestor about three and a half billion years ago and has diversified into all, all the life we see today. But physicists tell us that the universe is very, very old, and we do not think we are the only planet with life on it. So it might be that when life began on Earth, there was already life on other planets in older parts of the universe, and that as life extinguishes in one part, it begins elsewhere. Physicists even think that the universe itself might be birthed and die continuously. But we don't have the answers to those questions yet. They are just theories, and scientists are actively looking. That's why there are many scientists around the world searching the sky for signs of life elsewhere. When Darwin put his theories, he didn't even know the word DNA, or we didn't understand genes. All these discoveries in the last 150 or so years have just solidified what he discovered and made it more, more beautiful. Are there other questions? I need to ask about you. Yes. Mm-hmm. 
So we have heard that uh, when, an, uh, when an animal or any organism dies, it leaves its uh, genes into the environment. So can we say that we have talked about that tortoise, the lonesome George? So he said like when it, uh, when it died, it has left its genes in the environment. So can we, like with other factors, can, the, can it form a new tortoise? Uh, or like if, it, if in case if it forms a new tortoise, what are the other factors required to build a new tortoise? Have you seen the movie Jurassic Park? Can you see the movie Jurassic Park? Can you see the movie Jurassic Park? Can you see so that is, is currently fantasy, but scientists, uh, we can save the DNA from animals that are going extinct. We have not been doing a good job of that, though. And perhaps one day we'll be, we will be able to grow a new tortoise, but we are not there yet. Because it takes more than just the right DNA to grow a new animal. That DNA has to be in a cell and in the right environment to turn the DNA on and off appropriately. So one day we might be able to take, what was it, Lonely George? Lonesome. We might be able to take Lonesome George's DNA and put it in the egg cell of a different species of tortoise and grow a new Lonesome George, but right now it doesn't work yet because they are too different of an environment. And I think it's time for tea break and we don't want to deprive you of that. So let's stop, but remember your questions. We can start with questions after tea. Thank you.